Steve, would you say uh, in your studies that you referenced um, when having people hooked up when positions were going for or against them, right? Different sizes, all that. Would you say that it, that's variable for different people? In other words, some people's emotional odometer, if you will, or sensitivity to, um, you know, market events and, and their own trading uh, is it some people's sensitivity is is high, some's low. Yes, definitely. So and largely that were two factors, really. One is our individual kind of disposition. So kind of our starting point genetically, kind of our, our risk tolerance as such. And the other one is is kind of down to um, exposure and experience. So in they did some research, uh, might have been MIT, low and rep in a few years back now. They looked at FX traders under volatile market conditions and had them all hooked up to a variety of different sensors. And the um, all traders had a higher level of stress as volatility increased in the in the markets, but the responses were lower in the more experienced traders and were higher in the novice traders. Such that obviously, as you would know, back in your water polo game days, when you first start playing, each game is a bit new. You're not so familiar, but as you've played more and as you play more and more bigger matches. Although there's always an element of stress, the familiarity to it, the exposure, you learn the coping skills that dampens down that response slightly. So, so yes, yeah. definitely, definitely individual. Yeah, well, it makes sense in that example, obviously, that, you know, a more experienced trader during volatile conditions would be uh, a little more calm, of course, you know, and with it. Um, and right off the bat, it would seem that, you know, someone's very sensitive to, you know, the needle moving just a little bit probably is not the greatest but you probably also don't want to be too lax either because if you you know start going against you your position if you will you know you can't be too slow to react right i mean so there's probably a happy medium there with how people's brains actually do work and process danger if you will or uh or reward you know risk and reward going for them or against them you don't want to be like you know like a little you know, uh, terrier dog where you're yip yipping and yapping all the time. But you also don't want to be uh, too slow to process what's happening, I would guess. Yeah. Well, what, what I do with my clients is we actually uh, run an assessment with them, a psychometric test, which looks at their risk disposition. And it gives us a, I won't go into the micro details, but on a, on a big picture, on a macro scale, we get a sense of their kind of preference for risk. So risk averse to risk seeking and whether they're a bit more um, intuitive or whether they're a bit more kind of analytical. That's kind of our kind of our two um, mm -hmm. axes. Um, and then what happens that's interesting is because we are all different in our preferences for risk, what we see in trading in, in the most skilled traders or the most successful traders is what they've done over time is they have learned how to trade the markets in a way that lines up with their risk personality. So if you're very sensitive to risk, um, for example, then holding big positions over time, which gives you a lot of exposure to risk ongoing, probably isn't going to be very comfortable for you. Whereas other people at the lower end of kind of, of the compass, as we call it, they're quite comfortable with, with large amounts of risk. They actually, they enjoy it. So they're able to hold those positions for longer, whereas those who are more sensitive and might maybe put it into a spread, or they might hold positions for a shorter period of time and trade smaller, but more frequently, just to minimize exposure to risk and actually also to uncertainty. And those two often are quite um, strongly linked. So I think it's a case of finding a way of trading that allows you to express your because all risk types have upside and downside. There's neither one better than another. It's just finding what we call risk congruence, the way that works for you. Yeah. And I love that because it's, you know, what you said, what works for you, what works for yeah. your brain? Because exactly. if, you, if you're trading in a way that's not compatible with your brain, then you're not going to be able to operate going forward. You're going to be, be difficult. All, be all clouded and messed up. That's why it's not because one way is right and one way is wrong. It's because it's right or wrong for your own brain. Yes. Yeah. And it's like with sports, right, Jim? I mean, if you think about each individual, we've all got different strengths and weaknesses that are going to lead us into some sports we're going to find um, easier than others based on our, you know, our, our builds and our in, what we enjoy and our strengths and so on. So not everyone's going to be water polo player. Not everyone's going to be a games player. Not everyone's going to be, you know, a high jumper or a sprinter. Everyone's going to have their own um, skills and strengths and genetics that will probably lean them into having more success in one niche or another. And that's the beauty of trading is there's so many ways that you, so many different markets, different products, different styles of trading that once you get a sense of who I am and what I'm trying to achieve, then you can start to think about where do I go to express that that's going to give me the best, well, A is going to be enjoyable, hopefully, and sustainable, but also bring me some success.